Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome to the University Hospital's Department of Medicine Grand Round Series. Today, we are pleased to have Dr. Richard Silver speak with us about lung disease from the non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Dr. Silver is an esteemed staff member of the divisions of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at University Hospitals in the Cleveland VA. Dr. Silver began his education at Duke University, where he earned a degree in history. He went on to obtain his medical degree from the George Washington University School of Medicine, followed by internship and residency in internal medicine at the Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. Dr. Silver then went on to complete a fellowship in pulmonary and critical care at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and a research fellowship in infectious diseases at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. He has been on the staff at University Hospitals, uh, at University Hospitals, the Cleveland VA, and Case Western Reserve University since 1995 and has been a member of numerous clinical and research committees. Dr. Silver is a respected researcher who has focused his career on investigating the pulmonary immune response to mycobacterium tuberculosis. He has had numerous publications in several prestigious journals and has accumulated many honors, including the American Lung Association Career Investigator Award. The recognition of Dr. Silver's work has led to multiple collaborations in this field, and he has garnered fund funding from the National Institutes of Health, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and the American Lung Association. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Silver. Thanks for having me. Um, well, thanks for coming. I, you know, when I was asked to do this, as was mentioned, my big uh, research interest is, and sort of overall interest is in tuberculosis, and so I asked Keith if it was okay if I talked about something related to tuberculosis, and he said, well, we've got lots of people here who want to talk about TB. Can you talk about something else? And then, so... I actually just did change the slide, believe it or not. And I said, sure, we'll talk about other mycobacteria, uh, the non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And I think a lot of what's known about <coughs> uh, the non-tuberculous mycobacteria is sort of generational, what, what people were taught at the time they were in school. So I'm just curious, was anyone kind of taught that the non-tuberculous mycobacteria are sort of contaminants, non-pathogens, don't worry about them? Anybody get that kind of... Education? I, I did. Yeah, some of the older ones. Um, so this has changed a lot, and um, I hope some of this is new to you, but the, the <clears throat> brief history of mycobacteria is that um, mycobacterium tuberculosis was the first uh, mycobacteria that was identified uh, in 1882 by Robert Koch. And you know, as you're all familiar with, it requires special stains and special culture techniques and stuff to, to identify and culture uh, the mycobacteria. And, and so it was only after one was discovered that people started looking for more, and they found a lot of them uh, in soil and water in particular. So they're sort of environmental organisms. Um, and with a lot of um, diseases that give some of these similar manifestations, <coughs> um, these were really only recognized as causing other diseases when tuberculosis became treatable. So some of you may know, for example, histoplasmosis, you know, can have some very similar findings to tuberculosis. wasn't really recognized as a separate disease until they started finding there were other diseases like this that didn't get better with uh, streptomycin and the other and PAS, which is basically the therapies they had in the 50s. So the non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Um, Emphasize again are uh, sort of environmental organisms, and they they are particularly relevant to water. They they grow in swamps and peat bogs, and in public water supplies. They're somewhat resistant to chlorine. Um, they also are in uh, biofilms, in water distribution systems, shower heads, and things like this. <clears throat> and the key thing from the public health point of view is these organisms are not contagious. And so, from a public health point of view. They're, they're not, you know, as important in terms of disease containment as tuberculosis, but there are outbreaks, and the outbreaks come from common source exposures, not from spread from one person to another. Um, so, you know, around here, you'll probably, in terms of the, the 
importance to your training, you're more likely to see infections with non-tuberculous mycobacteria than actually TB around Cleveland. But the, uh, as a public health matter, it's sort of a different issue. It's not as urgent. Um, there's other, <coughs> other phrases people use for this, just to have it in mind. Uh, some people like atypical mycobacteria, although I, uh, those of you who know uh, Fritz van der from the TB clinic, he always said, you know, who's to say which is typical? Didn't like that. Uh, mycobacteria other than tuberculosis has kind of a nice acronym. Um, the one that I really like, though, is, is maybe something you'll hear more about in the future, uh, environmental opportunistic mycobacteria, because that's really a phrase that kind of gives you a feel for what these organisms are. They're, re they're really everywhere, um, but the key is sort of the combination of exposure and, and the host, and there are specific hosts who seem to be uh, at risk. So this reminded me that um, some time ago I saw a poster like this, <clears throat> and most of it is true. It was a distinguished, ah, shoot. Sorry. Did I just skip several at once? Yeah, sorry. So distinguished professor award uh, speech. He had a lot of really impressive credentials, and it was his insights on diabetes. And, and the great insight, the fabulous insight was that it's the disease mediated by the interaction of environmental exposures and host susceptibility. And I, I was like, is that the best you got? You know, because is there any disease that is not mediated by the interaction of environmental exposures and host susceptibility? <clears throat> but unfortunately, I have to fall back on that myself here because that's really, I think, the big message about the non-tuberculous mycobacteria. They are environmental exposures, and not everyone is susceptible to them. <clears throat> so. We already touched a little bit on the history, but I'm going to talk about some of the diagnostics of TB versus non-tuberculous mycobacteria, <clears throat> what are called sort of the classical, old school, I'd say uh, before I was a fellow versions of uh, NTM disease, which are still around, and then the expanding spectrum of this, which, you know, for some of you, maybe stuff that, you know, was not new when you were in medical school and you've always learned it this way, or you might not have heard about it at all. So the major pathogens, um, probably the one you'll see most, that we certainly see most in our pulmonary clinics is uh, Mycobacterium avium complex, MAC, that has Mycobacterium avium and Mycobacterium intracelluliare. Mycobacterium kansasii is probably kind of the outlier in terms of disease manifestation. And then there's the rapidly growing pathogenic mycobacteria, or GPM. Um, and the one that, that is kind of the bad actor here, you could guess from the name, is Mycobacterium abscessus. Okay, so into some of the diagnostics. I thought I'd put this up front because I think there's, as there's more modes of diagnosis, there's more confusion. So, you know, back when I was in school, this was all we had was the skin test, PPD test. And just out of curiosity, who here has ever actually given someone a PPD test? Okay, more than I thought. More than I thought. Well, we used to do it on everyone um, when I was a house officer, but we were across the street from the largest men's shelter in Manhattan where there were always a few cases of TB. So, you know, this is a tricky test to do. You have to actually give the injection between layers of skin. You have to raise the welt or you haven't done it right. If you put the injection too deeply, you might not see a response. Uh, then people, especially now that they're not so common, don't always know how to read them. As you've heard, I'm sure that there's the erythema and then there's the induration or the bump, and you're s supposed to measure only the bump, the induration. Although in reality, I found usually they're about the same size. They always show them differently in the pictures. So, you know, there are some problems with this test, and one of them involves the non-tuberculous mycobacteria, which is why I bring it up. That, um, you know, we're told that the, the size of the reaction matters, and you may have heard that in, in the old days, they used to say that a positive test was greater than 10 millimeters for everybody. Now the definitions are, are much more expanded, and there's sort of different sizes are considered positive in different populations. So the more at risk you are, the lower the test needs to be for you to be concerned about it. But the reason there was ever a cutoff relates to these two figures here. So uh, a lot of people don't know that a, a real positive 
PPD test from MTB should be really big. As you see in this figure, the, the mean of that, uh, you know, this bell-shaped curve is about 18 millimeters. And the problem is there's big tails on either side. And this is in a population where there is no uh, atypical mycobacterial disease, like, say, in Alaska. Now, this is maybe more like in the southeast U.S., where there's a lots of, lots of non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And you see down here, you have this smaller peak. And that's, that's basically showing that other mycobacteria will respond to PPD, so it's not specific. And you could say, well, the size matters, but there's, there, obviously there's an overlap. So you could have an M. avium that gave you a response of 13 millimeters, and you could have an MTB that was 8. And so this is, this is one of the many problems with PPD testing. And one thing that I, I'm sure most of you do not know is there's also a, a different PPD, particularly for M. avium. And back when this figure was made, it was called PPDB for the, the batty antigen, which I think is the name of a particular TB hospital where they studied this. And just to show, this, is, this dates to the early 60s, but it was showing when they have military recruits and they tested them with this M. avium PPD, um, that there was a clear geographical distribution. And it's basically hot, mostly uh, moist climates. Um, so now one of the reasons that, that uh, M. avium is more widely spread now than it was 50 years ago is because the, the hot climates have moved north. It's, it's, I hope in this audience that's not too controversial a thing to say. There has been climate change. Um, so in terms of PPD testing, there are false positives and false negatives. And one of the false positives that's relevant in most of the world is people who have had BCG, the, which is M. bovis, which is a, sort of another non-tuberculous mycobacteria, exposure to other non-tuberculous mycobacteria, and hypersensitivity to the inactive components of PPD, which some people have. Usually that would be erythema and not induration. Um, and the false negatives <coughs> is that uh, if you've had very recent infection, you might not have developed cell-mediated immunity to TB yet. Uh, very young children don't have the capacity to develop this response. People who had recent viral infections can have sort of transient immunosuppression, and then generalized immunosuppression. Uh, there's always this issue that the unfortunate thing that comes up is people who are going to be on heavy-duty immunosuppression and they've already been on steroids, and you're talking about putting them on TNF blockers or something, and you want to know if they have latent TB infection, well, the PPD test isn't going to help you much. Um, and either there's the question, do you know how to place the test, and do you know how to read it? So now you have, and I'm sure you've all been ordering this, the quantifuron test, uh, also known as T-cell interferon gamma release assays. And this is based on fact that when we got into complete sequencing of bacteria, M. tuberculosis and M. bovis BCG were among the first bacteria that were sequenced all the way through. And what they found was that all strains of BCG are missing certain gene segments that are present in TB. And one of these areas of difference, the, the highly sophisticated name RD1, meaning region of difference 1, had several dominant antigens that stimulate CD4 cells, the ESAT6, CFP10, and CB77. So assays were developed to say, well, how about we use these skin test materials and we can distinguish between M. bovis, BCG, and MTB. And after they did it as a skin test thing, it wouldn't it be easier to do something different? So they made it into a blood test. And basically, let me just see if I have it here. Yeah, so I didn't get into the details. The quantifuron test is you have three tubes. One is empty. One has these peptides of those three antigens, and the other is a positive control um, mitogen. And you're looking, you incubate them overnight. You measure the interferon gamma produced, and it's, you have to have a positive mitogen response, and then your MTB response has to be a certain amount greater than your negative response to get a positive. So the advantages of this are, the big one is you don't need to have the subjects come back. Um, the other is it's more specific, particularly if you're looking uh, to distinguish in people who have received BCG before. There's no booster uh, effect with repeat testing, and there's no operator-dependent effect. Um, 
whoops, I don't have it here. So the catch is that um, some of the non-tuberculous mycobacteria actually do have this RD1 segment. Not all of them, but some of them do. So I think I'd bring that up later. <clears throat> so now to move into how this stuff applies. Um, so the non-tuberculous mycobacteria, the general thing is that you, these are not rare diseases. Um, there's a lot of people who have these, an increasing number, and what you have to know is the syndromes, basically when to look for it. And then when to look for it, when to send sputum, and of course, if you're, if you're looking at respiratory symptoms and you just send regular sputum, they're not going to do it for AFB culture. You have to recognize that and ask for it specifically. And then when you have positive cultures, you have to know that it's not, it's not a contaminant, it's not an artifact. <clears throat> and the, the criteria here is generally positive cultures, and the catch is you have to have at least two positive sputum samples. And we used to talk about this as an issue of colonization, but what it really is is kind of lab contamination. If you have two, you have more reason to believe that this is a real pathogen. But I, I think that's, it's a little, um, there's a little room for error there because if you have someone whose syndrome is so strongly suggestive of one of these diseases, then you, you know, how many positives do you really need to have? Um, the alternative is you can have one positive BAL sample or you can have a lung biopsy that has consistent histology as well. And again, this, I'm going to get into the specific syndromes, but I just wanted to give you the overview up front. Um, so the treatment of NTAM infections, <clears throat> what's similar to tuberculosis is you have to take multiple drugs for a long time. The difference is that these organisms are, I think with one exception, totally resistant to isoniazid, so it's really not part of the regimen. And the other is that the length of treatment, there, there's no prescribed treatment as we say active TB is, you know, six months and we have the standard therapy. With the non-tuberculous mycobacteria, it all comes down to how long did it take for their sputum to convert to being culture negative, and then you treat them for a year after that. Um, and obviously, if you, if you give it a second thought, that's a problem if the person's only positive culture was from a bronch, because you're not going to... You're not going to do a bronchoscopy on them every couple months for a year and a half to follow that. So that becomes sort of a clinical judgment issue. Okay. So in terms of the evolving spectrum of uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria, again, if, you, if, you're, if you're probably younger than 40, it's, it, this is the way that you've always known it. Um, but in the old days, we talked about there was kind of one standard finding of non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease, and that was cavitary disease that looked like TB. And then <clears throat> what they call pseudo-cavitary disease is your first glance of the x-ray, it might look like an infection causing a cavity, but it, what it really is is you have areas of old belay and damage with infections surrounding those areas. So it's a little bit different. And, and the other was MAC as a, as a disease in people with advanced and untreatable AIDS, as it was back then. And the, the, the thing, especially at that time, pre-1990, was that most of these organisms were, were essentially untreatable. So this was the kind of thing you would see. Uh, again, this could certainly be tuberculosis. You see a lot of scarring in an upper lobe. Uh, you see some volume loss and cavities and so on. And in a patient with this look, you could get the same sputum. You see the, the cells and the AFB here. Um, and what you could find with this with cavitary disease is you could have uh, a positive AFB smear and an MTB gene probe would be negative. And you, what, what might this be? Anyone want to take a shot? It could be a few of them, actually. This would be, exactly, would be Mycobacterium cancassii. So the gene probes are organism specific. Again, but the, the quantifieron testing and stuff is not. So M. Kansasi, I'm just going to remind you, is one of the ones that would show up positive on a quantifuron test. And the disease really looks like TB. And um, the difference is it's environmental. It's geographic distribution. It doesn't, you don't have to think about it too hard. It's in the central U.S. like spreading out from Kansas. And um, again, unlike most of the other non-tuberculous mycobacteria, it contains the RD1 segment. So 
uh, it will be positive in the, quote, TB-specific quantiferon blood test, but negative with gene probe and that kind of thing. And <clears throat> the issues here, I, I would say these are, again, they're not terribly rare. I would say at any given time we have at least a few of these patients in the pulmonary clinics at the VA. Um, the clinical syndrome is very much like tuberculosis. I showed you the x-ray. They'll have the weight loss, the chronic cough, and all that. But a key is it's not contagious. Again, so the public health implications are different. And, and the one difficult thing about that is you probably can't get rid of these patients by referring them to your county TB clinic because they, so you guys can take care of them. Um, it can be seen in non-cavitary form as well. And the treatment regimens, when you compare them to TB, are based on the fact that this organism is universally resistant to pyrazinamide. So this is, this is again, the one... MCANS SCI is, I would say, it's the atypical, atypical mycobacterium. It's really more like TB. It's, um, it causes TB-like disease. You can treat it with INH, and it has a positive quantiferon test. But you can't treat it with PZA. So it's INH, um, ethambutol, and, and uh, rifampin. Pyridoxine is, you know, vitamin B6. Um, so I, I mentioned in passing before, almost all of the non-tuberculous mycobacteria are resistant to INH. This is the one that is susceptible to it. But if it's, a, if it's not MCANS ACI and it's not MTB, forget about INH. It doesn't help. Oops. Okay, so then the other thing you can have is this pseudo-cavitary disease. And this probably doesn't show up very well, but if you want to trust me, in this Pre-X-ray, there's actually a, a kind of bullous lesion, thin wall, and sort of cavity thing here, and it looks more noticeable here. But it still doesn't really have the features of a cavity. There's not a thick wall, and what you're kind of seeing is an infiltrate that surrounds this area. So that's what they mean by pseudo-cavitary disease. And this shows, you know, more of the same. Again, if you, well, what would really help you would be to have the old films and see that this thing was present before. And sometimes they don't show up that well unless you have them outlined by this sort of infiltrate. Um, and then you can have structural lung disease. This is, again, you see these old abnormalities here. They don't show up so well here. This could be, for example, someone who had old TB that had healed or a sarcoid or something, or um, people who had radiation, for instance. <clears throat> so for this kind of classic pseudo-cavitary disease, the, the standard organism was was MAC. And this could be uh, localized or diffuse emphysematous or fibrocavitary disease. And, and one of the hallmarks of the non-tuberculous mycobacteria generally is they're seen in, I would say, the, the, the prototypical patient is skinny old white person. Is, uh, actually, a few people come to mind with the recent uh, politics on TV. Um, but uh, so this would be thin male smokers, usually tall and thin, and older. Um, and most often in people who have very bad lung disease to begin with. <clears throat> and back again in this classical period before the 1990s, this was largely untreatable until the development of the broad spectrum macrolides, so the first one being clarithromycin, which remains one of the main drugs for treatment. So what predisposes to this? Again, the host is key. So it was advanced COPD, uh, anything that gave you kind of upper lobe cavities, old tuberculosis, granulomatous disease like sarcoid, uh, radiation fibrosis, or some kind of post-obstructive problem from bronchogenic carcinoma. These are the patients with classic MAC. <clears throat> and um, these organisms are resistant to lots of, of uh, antibiotics, but what's been found is that looking at the resist at the you know, the patterns of resistance in the lab is not useful except for the macrolides because basically if you're resistant to the macrolides, your treatment is totally different and is, is likely to fail, basically. So if people are uh, susceptible to macrolides, these are the treatments, <coughs> clarithromycin or azithromycin, rifampin, and ethambutol. Again, there's no role for isoniazid in treating these organisms. What you don't want to do is give macrolide monotherapy absolutely contraindicated, and, and the reason goes back to this, because if you get macrolide resistance, um, you're not going to be able to treat these patients. Um, and again, uh, the, the standard that goes for most of these is if you had a positive sputum to begin with, you treat them for 10 months 
after, uh, 12 months after the sputum culture becomes negative. Um, I should just point out, I don't think I emphasize it anywhere, but it, all of this is sort of a, a cautionary tale for thinking about how you use ZPACs. Azithromycin is a really valuable drug for treating highly resistant organisms that are becoming more common as pathogens. And, you know, the ZPAC is nice and really simple, but there's lots of old antibiotics that aren't as valuable that work just fine for this kind of stuff, like doxycycline. Um, so just think about that, especially if you have someone you're treating over and over again for infections, especially if it's a skinny old white person who's at risk for that. Okay. So this is sort of a different <coughs> ball game that uh, I would think most of you probably have never seen. Most of you less than 50 years old have never seen. Disseminated MAC and HIV infection. So this was very common as sort of a pre-terminal event prior to effective antiretroviral infection associated with very low CD4 counts. You see the high numbers of people who would get it when their counts gained, got close to zero, which is what would happen. And their symptoms were predominantly constitutional. And what's sort of interesting is that even these incredibly immunocompromised people um, really didn't get lung disease. It was really, it was, all, it was more a systemic thing. They would have it in their bone marrow. They would have diarrhea because of it. They'd lose a lot of weight. Um, but they didn't get lung disease. And it, it kind of speaks back to this whole thing about the susceptible host, that part of what makes hosts susceptible to MAC is some sort of underlying lung problem. Um, just being massively immunocompromised is not enough, it appears. Okay. So the, the, the modern story on disseminated non-tuberculous mycobacteria is how this has been uh, investigated in, <clears throat> in people who have disruption of sort of uh, CD4, TH1-mediated immunity. So that, obviously that's the major defect in AIDS. But there are other people who have it, uh, people who have, it was first described in people who have mutations of the interferon gamma receptors, but also in people who have mutations in IL-12 or the IL-12 receptor because that's necessary to develop TH1 responses. And this is familial. The, it's been recognized mostly in, in uh, families in Mediterranean regions. <clears throat> and the little irony in this is that um, for those of us who write grants on TB and who want to study the role of CD4 cells in protection against TB. We always cite this as reasons that what we're studying is important, but actually this really doesn't apply to TB. What these people are susceptible to is disseminated non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections, particularly if, if their family isn't recognized as having it, since they're in Europe where BCG is given, they can get a systemic infection from BCG when they're vaccinated because BCG is a live vaccine. And this has also been seen following lung transplants <coughs> uh, in people who had non-tuberculous mycobacterial before, especially M. abscessus, which is a big problem in cystic fibrosis. Okay. So now, the change. Again, for, the, for most of you, probably were not born in 1990. Maybe you've only heard of it this way. But I, I think, um, you know, I, my sense is our new pulmonary fellows don't know much about this, and so I imagine most internists don't. And I, I think it's important to bring up, because again, these aren't rare, rare problems. And it's really, it's, it's not as common as a sleep apnea, but it's similar to sleep apnea in that, you know, all you need to do to find these patients is start asking people questions. There, there's, I would say every week that I'm on at the VA, we see one person that's worth culturing their sputum for non-tuberculous mycobacteria, and maybe every other week one of those becomes positive. I mean, it's really not rare. So. <clears throat> A big change was kind of how we look at these. One thing was that they were no longer considered benign colonizers, that they just happened to be present in people with damaged lungs. But it's really been shown that, that lung pathology progresses when you have these and you don't treat them. And of course, the reason it dates to this time period is until you could treat them, there was no way of knowing that. Right? So once we had clarithromycin, you could actually treat these patients and you could see that their, the progression of their lung disease would slow down when you treated uh, the non-tuberculous mycobacteria. <clears throat> and I'd say back at this time, if you, if you were going to hear a talk about this, they would talk a lot about each different organism and the syndromes it would cause. But I think what's, what's become more uh, the, the kind of standard way of looking at it is there are a bunch of syndromes that involve these bugs. 
And you can have any one of them in any of the syndromes. And so it's really just to kind of know where, where should you be looking for this. And then it's, it still comes down to the culture. You're not going to know which one it is. <clears throat> the other part of this, I think, is that some of these syndromes are kind of more similar than was initially thought. People used to talk about cystic fibrosis. They talk about people with aspiration and specific esophageal disease, people with dysphagia from neurologic disease, alcoholics and kind of what were originally called sort of otherwise healthy, skinny white women. Um, and the unifying theme for all of these is that they're all associated with bronchiectasis. That's really where we see a lot of non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So this was from Time Magazine from uh, probably about 10 years ago now. And <clears throat> kind of gets at this issue of why, why are these organisms more prevalent now than they used to be? Well, one is the you know, changing climate the, the really hot, muggy weather has moved out of the southeast somewhat. But the other is changes in, in public water systems. So um, many of you may be familiar with the concept of uh, energy-saving hot water heaters. Ever heard of that? Okay, why are they energy-saving? Because hot water isn't as hot as it used to be. Yeah. So, you, you know, the, you hear stories of people putting, you know, forgetting to feel the water and putting their baby in and ends up getting burned all over. You really can't generally make a bathtub like that hot anymore. So one of the things when you have sort of a, uh, a hardy organism like the mycobacteria is that <clears throat> if you're not really heating them up, then you're not sterilizing the water of them. They can grow in chlorinated water. They can grow in warm water. They like it, in fact, until you get almost scalding. Are you, are you saying something to me? No. Okay. Sorry. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and, and the other is uh, that they seem to like to grow on biofilms and the kind of thing that you get if you, if you ever like change your own shower head and you see how slimy and gross it is. Um, that would be the other issue here. Okay. So non-tuberculous mycobacteria have been described in cystic fibrosis. And um, this association is not new, um, but has kind of come up uh, in recent years with two main organisms, MAC and M. abscessus. And currently, these are isolated from, uh, here you see 15 to 25 percent of patients with cystic fibrosis. So in MAC, the problem here is, again, you have a population that gets frequent lung infections that might often get treated with azithromycin, or they might use azithromycin as an anti-inflammatory agent to preserve lung function. And the problem is if you're developing resistance in these people, then you have, again, you go back to pre-1990s when you have an untreated organism. Uh, M. abscessums is, is a problem generally <clears throat> because there, there aren't good treatments for it. It's, it's, it's still kind of a, a, you know, you have to be lucky to clear it. Uh, and in some places, they, it's a contraindication to lung transplant. So uh, an interesting finding here is that MAC versus M. abscessans seems to sort with different populations. And basically, it's the, the sicker patients are more likely to get M. abscessans, which comes first. It might be harder to know. So the ones who get M. abscessans are more likely to be younger at the time of diagnosis. Um, they're younger at the time of uh, NTM infection. They're more likely to have the, the major, most severe genotype and they're more likely to also have sort of digestive problems and need pancreatic enzyme replacement. And the other part, which isn't surprising, is they've had more courses of broad-spectrum IV antibiotics. So it's a little hard to say, but it seems that part of this is you have people who have more severe disease from square one, and they're probably therefore getting selected out for worse organisms, but they also have greater susceptibility. The treatment outcomes are really poor. A National Jewish Hospital in Denver is kind of a major center for mycobacterial infections, and they say <clears throat> it's a chronic infectious disease characterized by variable clinical response, relapse, and little chance of cure. And the ATS, again, says there's no reliable or dependable antibiotic regimen. And this actually holds true for most of the non-tuberculous mycobacteria, even with effective treatment of M. avian. If you have localized disease, you may be better off just having surgery because these are still hard to treat even with good antibiotics. Okay, so, um, sorry, let me just see where I'm heading here. 
Oh, okay. So uh, this is showing another kind of X-ray, CT, that you might see in people with non-tuberculous microbacteria. And what they're talking about here is bibasilar sort of fibronodular disease. And again, especially if you take care of older populations, this is not particularly rare. And if you see this kind of thing generally, what sort of overall problem are you thinking of? Not an organism, just what kind of functional problem? Anyone want to guess? Hmm? Well, it can, bronchiectasis can be associated with it, and it does seem to be here. But let me put it this way. Going higher up towards the head, what problem starts this? The bibasilar infiltrates is basically aspiration. Okay, you have to think about aspiration. And in one of the things they used to talk about is being particularly associated with uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria comes here. You see this kind of dilated, funny-looking esophagus. And when you do a study of it, you find this person has achalasia. And achalasia was kind of listed as a cause of non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection. But the reality is it's anything associated with aspiration. And so what you get is this bibasilar lower lobe disease. It's kind of scarred. It's nodular. It can have bronchiectasis, as was mentioned. And it's not specific for an organism. You can see it with any of these. Uh, achalasia used to be this, uh, uh, said to be associated with M. fortuitum specifically, but it really could be any of them. But it's, it's that kind of story, swallowing problems with um, that kind of x-ray findings. We had a, a long-term, very difficult patient at the VA, personality-wise difficult as well, who had a, a paralyzed, paralyzed vocal cords and kind of chronic phlegm production and, and uh, Everyone kept wanting to say that he had interstitial lung disease, and, but he always was producing phlegm, and it ended up it finally got cultured and it was M. avium. So this, again, it's, it's not rare, but you have to think about it. I don't tell me they re repeated his sputum and it was negative. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the other thing that came out in the same time period was these reports of M. avium lung disease in patients, quote, without pre-existing conditions. <clears throat> and um, this is the, the skinny old white woman story. So it was, uh, this was kind of a, a sort of multiple case reports, 21 patients over 10 years, mostly females, older. Uh, they would have cough with perianal sputum, fevers, and weight loss were not very frequent. And their C, uh, chest x-rays would show multiple small nodules, and their PFTs were pretty normal. And a second series of this pointed out, again, this, it's, it's hard to believe, but at this time getting chest CTs was not that common. So when they started having chest CTs, they were able to say, well, this, this really often has disease of the lingula or middle lobe. Again, describing it in elderly female patients, <coughs> no cavitary disease, no adenopathy. And this to me is like one of the worst names for a disease ever. They call this Lady Windermere's, Lady Windermere syndrome based on an old play by Oscar Wilde. Has anyone read that, seen it performed? No. They're trying to show how sophisticated <laughs> they are, I think. Well, Lady Windermere was supposed to be a, a, a woman who really, you know, pushed the traditional image of what it is to be ladylike, and she said that, you know, a, woman would, a real woman would never spit. So therefore, they claim that the problem with these people was they were, they were trying so hard to be ladylike that they wouldn't spit, and therefore they had trouble clearing their secretions, Lady Windermere syndrome. <coughs> The thing I liked about this, anybody um, a fan of the Pretenders? A fan of the Pretenders? Somebody know who they are? Thank you. Okay. So the last line of this play is this. We are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars, which was also in a Pretenders song. You know which one? I know Chrissy Hyde's that. Yes, Chrissy Hyde, right. It's a message of love. So interestingly, Chrissy Hyde from Akron must have been a fan of Oscar Wilde. She came up with that. Okay. So this is the kind of CTs they're talking about, and <clears throat> basically, uh, this is the middle lobe. Uh, sorry, some might say the right middle lobe, but pulmonologists know there is no left middle lobe. So the equivalent on the left side is the lingula. And you see, you just have these kind of weird sort of nodular infiltrates, and I hope you can see that there's some degree of bronchiectasis here. And actually, this is showing the same person, just to show without treatment of the infection, it is progressive. And, you know, you can collect a lot of these, but um, just get used to noticing it because basically any time you see this, you should be culturing this patient up for non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And the, these are kind of a little more fibrous. Maybe the bronchiectasis is not quite as obvious. 
you know, here you're having some volume loss in the medial aspect of the middle lobe, same on the lingula. There's lots of examples. It doesn't have to be in those areas. You can also get it in the basal air regions, but this would be kind of more like the aspiration situation. It can get, get very destructive. Okay. So for Lady Windermere syndrome, non-tuberculous mycobacteria, and otherwise normal individuals, it's turned out that lots of things seem to show up in these patients. And again, it's, sorry, you know, it was mentioned I was a history major, so I, I, I think it's important to think about how these things fit together. At the time that these patients were reported as um, people with no underlying lung disease, cystic fibrosis was, was um, confirmed with sweat tests. There was no genetic testing for cystic fibrosis. And after the, the primary mutation was found, they found there were lots of other mutations that were less severe disease that weren't diagnosed until people were adults, young adults or even older adults. So it turns out a fair amount of these people actually have sort of less mild mutations of CFTR, and they really do have cystic fibrosis, just not, they have a milder variation of it. And so if someone suggests to you that you look for CFTR mutations in, in a 60-year-old person, don't think that, that your preceptor is senile. Um, it actually can happen. Okay. The other thing they had is abnormal genotypes for alpha-1 antitrypsin, although not uh, not associated with low serum levels. So not the same syndrome that causes premature emphysema, but nevertheless something, something funny about the tissues of your lung. And the other question is the role of body habitus. Again, the typical NTM patient is tall and thin, and a lot of them have chest wall abnormalities like pectus excavatum, scoliosis, and so on. And there's been some suggestion that maybe the, the abnormalities of their chest wall make it hard for them to have a good strong cough and clear these organisms. But the other idea is that it may be some issue with kind of abnormal connective tissue more generally, that somehow all fits together in susceptibility to bronchiectasis, because they're also known to have hypermobile joints. They have uh, more than background uh, frequency of mitral valve prolapse and so on. So there's, so there's probably not any of these people who are really normal. They, they have subtle abnormalities increasing their susceptibility to bronchiectasis and to NTM lung disease. You know, there's, there's more that will come out, obviously, as we understand this better. Okay, so the other thing is NTM lung disease in transplant recipients. And it, it's a problem in stem cell transplants. Um, approximately 3% have NTM infections. As you would imagine, it depends where, where your transplant center is and what the environment is like. And if, for example, you have some problem with your water system in a hospital of a floor where people are immunosuppressed. In solid organ transplants other than lung, it's not very common. But in lung transplants, it is not surprisingly more common than TB as a cause of lung infection just because it's around more in the environment more. And it's usually late in post-transplant course, frequently in the setting of chronic rejection. So again, you have damaged lungs plus immunosuppression as, as a setup. Uh, and the most frequent organisms, as with everything else, is usually MAC and, and Kansasii if you're in central U.S. Although when they get disseminated disease, that's more likely M. abscessus. Okay, so we mentioned this up at the beginning. The, the diagnostic criteria are really, does the person have symptoms? And the symptoms typically would be kind of chronic cough and phlegm production, basically. The radiographic findings, again, when you, when you throw out M. Kansasii, which is basically a mimic of TB, they're nodular, nodular opacities, bronchiectasis, small nodules, and you need the positive cultures. And the treatment, I think I've emphasized it several times, for everything except M. Kansasii, forget about INH, these are your drugs, and the treatment goes until you're culture negative for a year. If you have localized disease, it's really not at all ridiculous to ask the patient to have a CT surgery evaluation. The, the issue is, do you have surgeons who are willing to do these procedures? Um, okay, now this is an interesting one. Um, anyone, anyone ever spend time in an indoor hot tub? This is a very specific issue of, of environment. So why, why would people with hot tubs get non-tuberculous mycobacteria? It's mostly with indoor tubs, why? Because because the environment is enclosed and you, you increase the concentration of bacilli. Why hot tubs? 
because MTM are really hardy and they, they don't mind the hot temperatures. And of course, anyone who's done hot tubs knows they're very hem heavily sanitized with lots of chemicals. You know, it's abrasive to your skin, but not to non-tuberculous mycobacteria that are, that are hardy. So basically, you're kind of selecting out for most other bacteria, and then you can get pretty high concentrations of non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And what they get is basically findings that look like hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So they have poorly formed granulomas, they have a lymphocytic interstitial pneumonitis, and they have uh, bronchiolitis obliterans. And so, this x-ray is kind of unremarkable, but in this CT, uh, it's not a thing of how it's filmed here. The, the sort of darker areas are the relatively normal ones. And all this white is sort of uh, round glass infiltrates involved in most of the lung, usually especially the lower lobes. It can be a little less uniform than that. You can have kind of patchy opacities, ground glass infiltrates. And one of the findings, that, so bronchiolitis obliterans gives you obstruction of your small airways. And one of the ways you can see that on a CAT scan is to ask for inspiratory and expiratory views. So inspiratory, you see these kind of ground glass infiltrates. You see some areas that look spared. But when you do it in expiration, you see these spared areas look much more prominent. And that's because you have gas trapping from small airways obstruction. So the, the question on this is, is it really an infection or is it more a hypersensitivity reaction? Um, it's not so clear that antibiotics or steroids help, but what really is important is to get people away from the exposure. One of the, um, one of the, the main clinicians at Denver used to talk about a case they had where there was a family who all had lung diseases. They were in the hospital getting evaluated, and they were kind of told, well, we're, you know, we're waiting on these results. You know, just go home, try to take it easy. And it turned out they, these guys had an indoor hot tub, and they all just took it easy by relaxing in this hot tub for several days and came back much, much sicker. So it's really, if, if this kind of situation comes up, you really have to ask about that. Um, and if you see anything that looks like hypersensitivity pneumonitis, ask about hot tubs and hot tub lungs. Okay. So the summary on all this is that the, the non-tuberculous mycobacteria are involved with a wide range of kind of presentations. Again, M. Kansasii is the outlier as being sort of like TB in both clinical picture and treatment. Um, all the others are kind of different. And uh, there's multiple syndromes. Again, we mentioned them. The fibronodular disease, aspiration-related, the middle lobe, lingula, Lady Windermere. Um, as a public health issue, MTB is much more important because the non-tuberculous lung diseases are not contagious. But the, the fact is, unless you live in a TB endemic area or you um, work in a TB clinic, MTM, you're going to see NTM a lot more than you're going to see TB. And the key thing, again, is just have some familiarity with the syndromes and recognize this is something worth looking into when they have people who match. And there's really not much to be lost in sending sputum samples for AFB culture. Um, but the other angle there is you, you can't, when you get some weird thing that you've never heard of, M. gordoniae, M. fortuitum or something, don't just say, oh, that's a non-pathogen. If, if the syndrome is right, you really have to consider that a real finding and look into treating it. I think that's it. So I'd be happy to take your questions. The TB luminaries. But I, I'll have to make the first question now. Um, so I see a few patients in Kansas and it causes disease like TB. So why why isn't it contagious? Does anybody I know there's a few that doesn't make sense, right? It, you get it from the environment and it causes a disease like TB, but we don't spread it. I don't know. Just, I don't know. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, maybe it. You know. The, so the question I said I was supposed to repeat this for people who aren't here is. Why isn't MCANS-ACI contagious if it does cause similar t disease to TB? So the one thing in TB is we know you have to get these droplet particles that contain the organism. Maybe somehow in MCANS-ACI they don't develop those kind of droplets. It could even be that the organism is, you know, I don't. maybe Tom Daniel knows it's bigger and it doesn't, you know, you can't cough it out as well. I, I really don't know. Um, or it could be that there's subtle susceptibility factors that we don't know about. Sure. 
I'm sorry, say that again? Any data about MTM in subsequent to the Flint water debacle? Oh. Hmm. So, the, yeah, the question was, is there is there any stories relating to NTM in the Flint water issue? Not that I'm aware of. Um, you know, I think that's more, the, the issue there, I think, it, it wasn't sort of lack of sanitation. It was running running water through old pipes that had a lot of lead in them, and there was something about the chemical nature of the new water source that caused more leaching out of the pipes. So I don't, I don't think it was a sanitation issue as such. It was sort of a chemical incompatibility. That's what I know. Yes, Kathy? Okay, so the question is how much of a problem are the NTM in in uh, areas, I would I would put that as where TB is also endemic, but in tropical areas around the world outside of the U.S. Um, well, Tom Daniel just handed me an article about how he found a lot of uh, MAVM in dirt samples in Africa. I, I think it's kind of similar to the pre-antibiotic era here, is that when when you have so much TB on top of it, you know, people aren't going to recognize it or look for it as much. Tom? Well, we were looking. You were looking. Yeah. yeah. And, and the other thing that fits with that, is in that period you were there when AIDS was, you know, running wild in Africa, is that people with AIDS don't get lung infection from amavium. So it's really, it, you know, kind of suggests maybe that you don't even need your T cells to protect you from it. They do get TB, right. We saw, you know, I mean, back in the day in Uganda, you see you know, severe disseminated cryptococcus, you would see disseminated TB with, you know, but we never, I don't think we saw disseminated MAC, which suggests it really isn't causing human infection. Because I think we would have seen it in highly immunosuppressed HIV patients back in the 90s. Well, maybe there they would have died before they got that That's advanced true, from, from their, true, yeah. you know, with higher CD4 counts than we got to here. Okay. Yes. Wow, I, I don't know the answer on that. I mean, I would think um, I'm looking for help. If any of our CF people are here, um, you know, I think it's certainly something you want to keep in mind and use other drugs when you can. I don't know if there's a policy. No, Maybe. I, you know, it's, yeah. it's a great. I was thinking of a similar question because more and more we're using chronic dysmorphic therapy as an anti-inflammatory in patients with bronchiectasis, and it does. I mean, you raise this concern. It does concern one for selecting out resistance. Are you know, do have MAI and, and uh, as you say, the you know biggest mistake a, a non pulmonologist or a non ID doctor. And I should say these patients are very vexing to treat because it's lots of drugs for a long time and they easily get preferred ID for treatment because of the vexing part. But um, that was a joke. But uh, at least at UH they do. But um, I mean one of the mistakes you can make is is, is treat somebody. I mean there's a lot of people with single speeder for MAI and people treat that and, and that's not adequate or or they have MAI and they get monotherapy and macrolides, which you pointed out, and that's a huge, huge issue. But. I, I just think the the thing to remember is, you know, if you're not treating these illnesses, there's there's lots of lots of good drugs for respiratory infections, and we, you know, I mean, I when I get sick, I take a Z pack. They're easy to use, but if you're if you're dealing with susceptible populations, you should really think about using the old stuff because it still mostly works. Doxycycline is a great drug. Augmentin. This pen says doxycycline. Yeah. Anything you, else? Did you, one more question. Yeah, my question is, is there any link between it and the COPD people that have recurrent uh, exacerbation? Well, it's definitely, there's a link in terms of people with severe bullous disease are susceptible to kind of getting this, when we're talking about pseudo-cavitary disease, they get this used to be like you know when I started fellowship that was the MAV patient. Skinny old white guy with bullous emphysema would get kind of complications of that with MAVM. Um, in terms of being the cause of 
of um, you know, kind of unresolving or unexplained exacerbations. You know, I think in certain people it's worth looking for it. Um, I, I think the big problem we have is that, you know, you see a lot of old guys who smoke, again, particularly at the VA, anybody, any old smoker who has a respiratory complaint is said to have COPD, even when they don't have PFTs or their PFTs don't support that diagnosis. And so you, you have to think of other things, and, and certainly one thing can be some kind of chronic infection. I mean, I, I don't think there's any data to support the idea this is a widespread, unrecognized cause of COPD exacerbations. But... Um, you know, if the findings fit, it's worth thinking about it. And I, I, this patient I mentioned, because Frank and I both have had a lot of contact with him, had actually, one of the things he volunteered was that he had been treated with azithromycin for a couple weeks, and he had felt that that was the only time he had really gotten better after years of this problem. So it's, it, I, I, say, I would think about it in people who got multiple courses of azithromycin and said they were better for a while. I would think about it real hard in those people. So there's a tradition in case Western of tuberculosis research in clinical work, including non non tuberculosis mycobacteria. Manny Walensky wrote the classic paper. I, I don't know if Manny Walensky term came by the term MOT. He popularized it and I want to thank you for pitching in that tradition of expertise oh, thank and you. interest. So thanks for fantastic grand I round should mention that there there is a non tuberculosis mycobacteria named after him, Mycobacterium Walensky I. Awesome guy. Yeah, we yeah, thanks thanks. Well, thanks.